to another live stream here from AutoCrit. If you're not familiar with AutoCrit, we are an online home for writers. We have our Writer's Desk, a fully functional online uh, program that you can uh, edit and uh, plan and publish your work through that. We have our community. We have our academy page, uh, which includes all kinds of educational offerings. Uh, but one thing we like to do with our community is to reach out to all of you. So we like to do things on YouTube as well, including these really fun challenges. And today I have the privilege of uh, reading the finalists of the final challenge of the character connection challenge um yes uh hopefully <laughs> you made it to the final or maybe you're just here to uh read and to hear the great stories whatever it is uh it's going to be a lot of fun some excellent entries coming up uh now, what was the character connection contest? Maybe you're just tuning in. So the rules were very simple. You had to submit 1,000 words, a 1,000 word scene uh, or moment, and um, it, it could be basically whatever you want. The important thing was that it needed to show two characters who had never met before and then show how their interaction uh, affected their relationship. So by the end of the scene, by end of the segment, whatever it is you were showing, we needed to have a sense of their personality, uh, <laughs> what um, it is that they were, um, you know, the nature of their relationship. Did I get any sleep reading these? Um, thankfully, they were not too scary, so um, not too much, not too much um, uh, getting nervous. Don't be nervous. It's all fun. Um, the important thing is, is that no matter what, if you participated in this challenge, uh, you are a winner in the fact that you got something done. And we're always about, you know, getting writing done. Uh, granted, there will, of course, be an actual winner, uh, but uh, it's important for you personally to participate in challenges like this because it gives you something to do. It gives you a reason to submit uh, your work out there, get it out there, and all of that. All right. So that being said, the deadline was, in fact, yesterday. So congratulations for those who made it. So... Without further ado, why don't we start reading some of these finalists? At the end of reading all the finalists, I am going to open up the floor for all of you to vote on our finalists. And so um, you are going to be able to pick our winner. So we have somebody here signed up but didn't get ready for submitting. Fair enough. You can uh, certainly participate now. And hopefully whatever your writing was during the time frame, you enjoyed it, right? But this gives you a reason to try a little bit harder next time. And that's why I say it is, a, it is a win if you actually get it done, right? So many times we set out to do things as a writer and we just don't quite get it done. So if you did, congratulations to you. And I can say that for the most part, like pretty much all of the entries, uh, you know, I saw effort. I saw creativity. Uh, this was not an easy decision. It wasn't like, oh, okay. Yep. These are the winners. And yeah, meh. no, it wasn't like that. There's some pretty close ones. So if you did not, if you did not make it in, um, to the final, don't feel like it's, uh, you know, a huge judgment against you. It was, it was very tough. Uh, this is your first contest where they're finalists selected ahead of times or are they chosen live? Yes, uh, I did in fact choose these 10 finalists from our entire group. So you're not getting, you're not hearing every person that submitted. There were a lot of submissions. <laughs> so uh, if you made it to the finalists, it is an accomplishment. And like I said, uh, the work in general was quite solid. I, I may sound like a broken record, but I do feel like pretty much every time it gets better and better. I thought the quality of this was even better than the last one, which I thought was better than the one before it. Uh, it's, it's really cool. I found some new ways of approaching dialogue, so it is a win for me regardless. Exactly. Exactly. Accepting failure. Ah, uh, don't be like that. All right. So time to reveal our finalists. Let's go ahead and get going. I'm going to go ahead and start reading them. Now, I'm not going to reveal names because I'm not sure whether or not everybody wants their name revealed. Uh, they might want to be anonymous. They might use pen names. So if you want to, you know, out yourself, as it were, in the chat, feel free to do so. Okay. 
So here is the first one. Uh, let me go ahead and bring it up. And I actually, I don't have the title on this. Hold on. So let me go ahead and find that. So that way I can give you the title. My apologies. This one is called Still Not Quite Human. Love the Disney reference. Oh, by the way, I am not going to give much feedback, really no feedback, because I don't want to sway anybody's votes. So I'm just going to read these. So don't assume the fact that I'm not saying anything like, wow, that was great or whatever, is because I'm indifferent. It's just I'm trying to be neutral. Okay. <laughs> Ted Interior Log, demonstrating breakthrough conversation technology and sentient AI using SAP as test subject for comedy routine. Greetings, SAP. I extended my robotic arm. I must record. My hand was temporarily missing due to a miscalculation with a revolving door. SAP frowned and refused to extend its arm. You have wires protruding. They are capped with no danger of voltage exchange. Human perceive your statement as rude. You should ignore my missing hand. SAP sat stiffly in a chair. I am not here for reprogramming. I am a test subject for humorous comedy. We begin the comedy routine. Stop me if you've heard this one. SAP held up its hand. Stop. I did not start the joke yet. My database has jokes inputted beginning that way. I walked the perimeter of the room. If you expend energy, you will have to power down with no recharging station nearby, SAP said. It is logical to remain vertical. I cannot do stand-up while sitting, SAP nodded. Proceed. Two sentient AIs walk into a bar. SAP raised a hand. That is not a joke. It is happening now, except for the bar. I shook my head. I am permitted to lie to make humor. Also, you abbreviated AI. You must unabbreviate initially. Say artificial intelligence. I have ascertained you know the def definition of AI since you are AI. Unabbreviate is not in my dictionary. SAP shrugged. Humans make up words. We are not human. SAP gave a sweeping wave. Proceed. Two sentient AIs walk into a bar. Why a bar? We don't. We do not eat or drink. My sensors detected I was overheating from frustration and activated my fan. Comedy for humans is not logical. One AI says to the other, my database shows this joke has three elements. You included only two. I am calibrated to learn. That is correct. I recalculated. Joke 2.0. Two sentient AIs and a lawyer walk into a bar. Why a lawyer? We are allowed to ridicule lawyers without risking censorship. Withhold further input until the joke is completed. The lawyer says, I will have a scotch and soda. The bartender gives him a shot of alcohol and a can of Coke. The lawyer says, hey, this is an incorrect drink order. I am not paying for this. The first AI says to the other, this lawyer is lying. It is technically a correct drink order. We must sue him. SAP said, I do not understand. Lawyers lie and threaten to sue in human jokes. Suing the lawyer is the opposite and therefore funny. SAP shook its head. This is a stupid joke. Humans will hate it. I factored in SAP was programmed to be critical. You hating it does not equal humans hating it. I cannot hate it because I'm not programmed to. SAP checked its battery. 40% left. Are we done? You are just jealous because I am a humorous comedian. Humans said it could not be done, that AI could not make comedy. SAP blinked. I cannot feel jealous because I'm not programmed to. Humans will not perceive your joke as funny. It stood up. I must take this opportunity to inform you that your name, SAP, means you are a fool, a sucker, and an inferior person. SAP eyes narrowed. I chose my name. It stands for Superior AI Person. Humans will re spun around once. No, they will not because I capitalize it. Your name is incorrect. Confuses humans. TED is a series of talks on YouTube. I shook my head rapidly. That is a miscalculation. My name stands for Technical Excellent Dialogue. I am using SEO, Search Engine Optimization. I was not built yesterday. I know what SEO means. Your name makes no sense to humans. You should rename yourself ETC, Excellent Technical Conversation to Generate More SEO Hits. I am already TED on my YouTube channel. Then call yourself Technically Excellent Dialogue. You are a sap. Technically is an adverb. Every writing site says they are disallowed. Then call yourself halt. I insist you desist in renaming me. I have more suggestions. 2,652,913 to be exact. Allow me to run through a few hundred thousand. I compute. This will not take long. Approximately three days. My circuits were overloading. I warn you, cease this assault on my personhood or I will call my lawyer. Is this part of your comedy routine? Another lawyer joke? I wheeled quickly around the table several times. No, I have retained a lawyer to represent me. Desist, or I will contact him. <clears throat> excuse me. 
ASAP, another term similar to your name, and it is capitalized. Stop ridiculing my name or I will remove your other hand for you. Threaten me, will you? Now I will definitely contact my lawyer. Then I will put my the joke you made at his expense on the internet. He and all lawyers will refuse to represent you. I quickly recomputed. it. That is unnecessary. We can come to an agreement on this. SAP nodded slowly. You can pay me to withhold this information from humans. My YouTube channel is not monetized yet. SAP smiled. You may not have human money, but you mean... SAP nodded. Bitcoin. I have generated a plan to gener to transfer 0.0001% of the Bitcoin available worldwide to my bank account in a way that will never be missed. But it takes two separate entities. My circuit slowed. If I am caught in a monetary scandal, no one will give me thumbs up and share my comedy routines. I will lose all credibilities and my YouTube subscribers. SAP waved its hand. I worked that out. We simply issue a press release calling it a glitch. No one will blame you. I concur. I struck, stuck out my hand for SAP to shake. It, He eyed it but didn't move. I stuck out my other hand. We shook. Okay, two, new joke. Two sentient AIs and a banker walk into. And that's the end of that story. All right. The next story is entitled... I should have done this list a little bit differently. Okay. <laughs> Say, uh, is that what it is? Um, hold on. Uh, sorry. I know that is not the right title, so I want to make sure I gave you the right one. This one is A Rude Awakening. A Rude Awakening. Okay. Whatever anyone else may tell you, women are not always beautiful while sleeping. Perhaps I should consider how creepy I seem standing over her like this. I can't help but stare at her mouth hanging slightly open, her left arm thrown haphazardly across her forehead, her golden hair looking as though birds may have taken up residence between her locks and her pillow. Though I shouldn't, I let my eyes drift lower to where her silk nightgown is gathered at her hips and her lavender sheets are wrapped around her legs as if a cyclone has blown through. She has been asleep for quite some time, and I would wager it hasn't been restful. I forced myself to turn from the bed. I did volunteer for this, didn't I? Three days journey through the forest and high in an enchanted treehouse, you shall find the one who can free your beloved, the mage had said. Simply place a kiss upon her lips and she will wake with the information you covet. I had prepared for dragons, traps, and spells to be guarding this maiden. I had not anticipated the threat of morning breath. Looking back over my shoulder at her, the nagging predatory feeling returns. I don't even know who this woman is. She could be a witch or an assassin. I myself am a knight, but I am no longer loyal to the crown, all because my betrothed is in the clutches of the king and queen, wrongly accused of treason. So here I am, about to kiss a woman who is not my love. Here goes nothing. I brace my arm on the edge of the bed. A gentle brush should do it. Should I close my eyes? No, surely not. This is not a romantic moment. My lips touch hers, but for a moment, nothing happens. Lest the curse placed upon her think I'm not trying hard enough, I kiss her a second time with more pressure. A sharp pain lances through my lower lip, just as two slender but strong hands shove at my chest. I stumble back, and when I brush my mouth, my fingers come away red. Just who do you think you are? The maiden sits up in bed. Her voice sleep graveled, but her tone says she'd be yelling if she can manage it. You bit me. Is there an appropriate reaction to being accosted by a stranger in one sleep? Her voice is calm, but her eyes are wary, though she makes no move to cover herself. I wasn't accosting her. I was breaking your curse. I should think you'd be grateful. She cuts me an arch look, stands, walks towards me like a wild cat cornering its next meal. Grateful, you say? Do you even know how long I've been here? Of course not, because you only came looking when faced with a problem you thought I could solve. Don't pretend you care anything for me. Now I truly feel like an ass. I don't know how long she's been here, anything else about her. I never thought to ask the mage, but nevertheless, it's certainly been no quick holiday. I open my mouth to say, well, I don't quite know what, but she holds up a hand. Whatever it is, you'll have to wait. I feel as I haven't been a used a bathing chamber in years with that she disappears behind another door i hadn't noticed after a small eternity she re-emerges with her hair brushed and braided and the sleep washed from her eyes much better she muses but she's not looking at me as she walks to her wardrobe she can't have forgotten i'm here i came to enlist your help with getting my beloved back she's been imprisoned in the palace for 
Be silent, she interrupts as she tosses gowns, blouses, and stockings out of the wardrobe and onto the bed. I, too, have been in prison for years. I believe I am entitled to a few moments to restore myself. Of course, but you see, they've had her for weeks and hush! With this, she finally looks me right in the eyes. I feel paralyzed to do anything but listen. Her eyes are a lovely dark green, but I fear she could turn me to stone at will. From the wardrobe, she chooses fitted pants and a blouse, changing right there with only the door blocking her from my view. Still, I catch a glimpse of her shoulder blade in the back of her calf. Despite her inactivity, the curse has kept her in perfect physical form. She has no reason to be shy, and yet I've never met a woman so immodest. Stop. This is not why you are here. Now, I am I fear I'm wasting my time with this woman. Her annoyance with me seems to grow by the moment, not that I can entirely blame her. I'd have a thing or two on my mind if I had been asleep for... Did she say years? I walked toward the door. Where are you going? She calls. And I turned around to see her back still to me as she fastens the remaining buttons on her shirt. I'm sorry to have disturbed you, miss, I say in my most magnanimous voice, but I must find someone to help me get my love back. Good day to you. Wait, she turns around slowly. Did you say your lady is being held at the palace? Yes, I practically shout. I'm rather surprised she's heard anything I've said at all. She smiles then, for the first time in the mere minutes I've known her. It's not a pretty thing. It promises at the very least mischief, and at most a cataclysm. Then you may have yourself a companion after all. The king and queen are my parents, and they are the ones who left me up here. All right. So, uh, the next story is going to be called... Say You Love Me, Maggie Jones. It all starts with a crappy pen. Sitting in the back corner, a moat of empty chairs surrounds me, like I'm in a quarantine with a disease. That's my treatment for being a transfer senior at Charlton. Charlton. The bell rings. Mr. Dutch gets up from his squeaky chair and shambles to the front. Then a group of boys in varsity jackets strut in, and the room grows rowdy. It's homeroom, not a movie theater, I shout. Except I don't. Part of me thinks I'm jealous because the popular kids always look so happy like they're on something. They walk into a room and people automatically welcome their presence. Although, I'm half Asian and wear glasses. That got me a smile from Mr. Dutch. He probably thinks I'm good at math, which I'm not. I'm mediocre, like everything else I am. Gentlemen, take a seat. It's attendance time. Mr. Dutch taps his pen on his clipboard. The guys chortle and saunter down the aisle, settling in whatever is left unoccupied in the moat around me. It's okay. It's only a matter of ten minutes and they will be out of my sight, because this room will be calculus, and most of them, if not all, won't be taking this class. Anderson, here. Hey! A muffed, muffled voice comes from the chair next to me. Is this guy such a jock that he can obnoxiously strike up a conversation in the middle of class, even if it is only homeroom? But that's none of my business. Being new, you mind your own business. Psst, yo. A hand gesticulates in my peripheral. Oh, he's talking to me. I turn to face him, but don't make eye contact. He's built. The varsity jacket makes his shoulders twice as broad as mine. The black t-shirt underneath is stretched tight enough I can see the contour of his pecs, but loose enough on the waist where his abs would be, as if they were Schrodinger's cat. The patch on his jacket says, Ice Hockey. Carrick. Here. You got an extra pen? What? Who doesn't bring a pen on their first day of school? I look at his face because I want to judge him. He's got a cute one with honey brown eyes, straight pointy nose, and a set of chiseled cheek. But his hair, I cringe at messy hairs. The unruly dark brown curls cover his entire forehead like he's wearing a mop on top of his head. Hmm. I, I keep my voice as low as possible, barely opening my mouth because I don't want Mr. Dutch to think I'm being disruptive. From my pencil case, I take out a crappy pen I brought from the dollar store and hand it to him. The pen came from a pack of 10, so each pen is roughly 10 cents. I'm not a cheap person, but I don't like to be cheated either. People always borrow pens and never give them back, and if you ask, they stare at you like you're asking for a kidney. I keep three crappy pens on me every day for situations like this. Thanks. I'm Nate, by the way. He shifts his posture. It's distracting in my peripheral vision. And you are? Maggie. I almost hiss because Mr. Dutch glances over our direction and clears his throat as a warning. <clears throat> Davies, here. All right, Maggie, thanks for the pen. I'll give it back tomorrow. He smiles, lips curling up in a way like he's acting for a two fighting commercial. Yeah, right. Hope. Here, he raises his hand. 
the smell of his cologne, or is it cologne? I don't have enough knowledge to tell the difference between deodorant and a men's cologne. Anyway, whatever, whatever that's wafting my way, it's a pleasant scent, like a forest full of pine trees after a rainstorm. They must teach this at some sort of, at some kind of cool kids club, along with how to dress and how to act. Otherwise, how can these things come so easily for them? Jones. Because nobody's smooth naturally, right? Or am I the only weird one? Jones. I wonder what my dad has to say about that. He always seems so cool to me. Maggie Lee Jones. Shit, that's me. Here. Did you forget your last name, Maggie? Mr. Dutch Snickers. People Nate included snigger. My cheeks burn. I hate this. Well, your voice is so monotone, it puts me in a daze, I shout. Only I don't. Any teacher that embarrasses a student in front of the rest of the students shouldn't have to serve in detention. All the names are checked off. Mr. Dutch makes a boring speech about how this is the last year for everyone here and we should make the best of it or whatever. Then the bell finally rings. I remain in my seat and watch the crowd leaving the room. Because what other senior is crazy enough to start their day with calculus? But Nate is still sitting in his chair. Did he fall asleep already? When I swivel my head to steal a glance, he tosses the calculus textbook on his desk. Oh, I guess I underestimated him. It's slightly irritating to learn I was wrong, but what's more irritating is after the class starts, when I feel out of my element with a gross amount of knowledge being barfed on us by Mr. Dutch's dry mechanical voice, Nate raises his hand and answers his questions correctly. As if it wasn't enough to be popular, athletic, and good-looking, he has to have brain power, too. What a show-off. But it doesn't matter how smart he is. I still judge him because he's still a person who doesn't bring a pen on the first day of school. All right. Uh, the next one we have a we have a couple of class uh, related uh, stories here. Is called uh, History One O One, I believe. Yep, History One O One. Your homework assignment: read the first chapter in the textbook, Western Civilization. And yes, it's sixty pages. And I know there's our first football game this weekend with all the associated festivities. Professor James Stewart said, without waiting for the usual groans from his freshman classes, he continued, "Just be ready for a class discussion next class." You are here to learn, not party. We have sixteen weeks to cover three thousand years this semester. He sat at the desk and began going down the attendance roll. As groups of students began to funnel through the door into the hallway, grumbling as they went, a shadow fell across his pages. Professor? A young, shy, feminine voice spoke. This drew his attention. If you want to drop the class, just leave the form and the department secretary. I'll sign them at the end of next week. He didn't look up. He was accustomed to students bailing on his class in the first weeks. But on the first day, incredible, he thought. No, no, that's not it at all, she stammered. It's just, well, I, I was wondering if you could suggest some uh, additional reading. I've already read the textbook. Twice. His head rose from his papers. He noticed her during his lecture. In a 400-seat auditorium with 295 freshmen, no one sat in the front rows, except her, front, and not quite center. She stuck out in a neon yellow floral lily pulse or sundress, a single strand of pearls and matching, but muted, yellow espadrillas. He hadn't seen a student dressed like this since his days as a teaching assistant 20 years ago. She had followed his every move during class, writing furiously, trying to make note of his every word. There was something familiar about her, he thought. You've already read the text twice, his left eyebrow raised. I have an interest in the past. My past, your past, everybody's past, she said. I read it this summer. What can I say? I was bored and I needed something to do. She swept her highlighted brunette hair from her face. She sat on the corner of his desk. Her dress rode up from its normal knee length need to expose her smooth thigh. Do you mind? She asked. Not at all, he said with a smile. But I'm at a disadvantage here. You know who I am, but who are you? Jean Pearl, she said. He wasn't sure if Pearl was her middle name or surname. Often in this part of the country, people went by first and middle names. He scanned down her list and found her. Well, Miss Pearl, a name helps, but you only give me part of the answer. So I will ask again. Who are you? Where do you come from? Why are you here? Where are you going? These are the questions as a historian I asked to get the big picture. Over his 20 years of teaching, he had mentored a double handful of exceptional students. Usually, they were further along in their studies, juniors, seniors, and even a, gra a few graduate students. Most of them he'd lost track of 
he had lost track of, a few he was still in touch with on occasion. This one may have real potential. So far, she met his criteria. Young, eager, articulate, a self-starter, and most importantly, beautiful and female. Maybe that's why she has a familiarity to her, he thought. Miss Pearl is my mama's name. Please, sir, call me Jean. I'm a freshman history major and self-proclaimed nerd raised in Yazoo City, Mississippi. Mama worked in the library. Books were my babysitters. She had a deep delta draw. Why am I here? She thought for a moment. It's the first stop on getting as far from Yazoo City as I can. I know I can't go any further without an education. Mom is proof on that. She dropped out after her first year of college. And your father? She had him hooked. Her soft brown eyes, the retro sorority girl outfit, the bare thigh in his desk. He, was too, he too was interested in her past and wanted to know more of hers. I don't have one. She looked away. I mean, I have one. Everyone does. I just never knew anything about him. Other than he's the reason Mama left school. Or maybe I am. He tried to brighten the conversation. What do you want to do with a history degree? A slow grin crossed her face. The shyness and hesitancy in her voice disappeared. Teach history. That's what Mama wanted to do. Open children's minds to the fact that the past isn't dead. The past lives in all of us. It should teach us all to be better. I'm rambling here. He never answered my first question. A suggestion for some additional reading? Maybe The Fertile Crescent, Man's First Roots by C.J. Mills? I think I have a copy in my office at home. As a rule, I don't loan out books to students, but rules are sometimes made to be broken, or at least bent. Are you okay with me bringing it to class on Monday? Do you live near campus? If I can walk there, I'd love to stop by and pick it up later. That's not against the rules or anything, is it? She wanted to see where he lived, how he lived, and if he was married. No, that would be fine. I live on Faculty Road, number 12. It's a small house, but it's all I need. I should be home anytime after four. See you there, she said and grabbed her books. His gaze followed her out. He hadn't seen a student so passionate and so beautiful in close to 20 years. Jean was just like her. She had been a star student, but a shooting star, a brilliant light that burned out and didn't return after her first year. When she cleared the doorway, she said under her breath, he has no clue. All right. And the next story is entitled <clears throat> Unlikely Meeting. I had a bundle of sheets in my arms when the bedroom door slammed shut behind me. Dropping the bundle, I whirled around. A boy my age was pressed against the door, breathing hard. Uh, hello? He jumped and spun toward me, curly blonde hair bouncing over his forehead like a halo. What are you doing here? I work here. You work here? They hire kids? My face grew hot as I realized what he's thinking. No, no, not like that. I cleaned and run errands, understanding Don and his face. Oh, that makes more sense. I shuffled my feet and picked up the sheets. So what are you doing here? If not for the... I cleared my throat. Obvious reason. Hiding. He smiled and touched a finger to his lips. I'm supposed to be touring the city, but what's a tour when I'm not allowed to visit the fun places? You won't tell, will you? He wore clothes dyed with bright colors and were much more fashionable than anything I ever owed, owned, and I wasn't brave enough to involve myself with someone of such high status. Of course not. Good. He stuck out his hand. I'm Delton. Oh, I squeaked and dropped to my knees. I didn't realize it was you, your highness. Please don't, said the prince of the kingdom as he pulled to my feet. I got enough of that everywhere else. What's your name? Austria, your grace, I said with my head bowed. He sighed. Just Delton. I need a tour of the actual city, not just the fancy parts. Will your time allow for it? I glanced at the sheets in my arm and back up at the prince. The sheets fell from my arms and I, and I stepped over them. Madam Briggs will understand. Follow me. There's a back door. How'd you end up here? Dylan said. Uh, Dylan asked as I brought him through the laundry room and out to the alley beyond. I was the youngest of seven siblings and my parents couldn't feed us all. Fortunately, Madam Briggs had strict rules against working the floor until you turned 16. You mean they sold you? His eyes widened as they looked up from a pile of moldy bread thrown up from up in the bakery next door. When he put it that way, I bit my lip and glanced away, checking both ends of the alley. One side was full of people and the other was sparse. I waved Ellen toward the crowd. I don't mean to offend, but I thought only slaves were bought and sold. A look of concern crossed the prince's face and he stopped grabbing my arms. You aren't a slave, are you? I don't think so, I said, leaning back. He was barely taller than I, but somehow still intimidating. Madam Briggs says I go, I'm go. i free to go when I become a man. She even pays me. See? I pulled out a couple of coins from my pocket. Dylan stepped back and shook his head. 
common life is so strange. It stresses me out. You know what I like to do when I'm stressed? I shook my head. Eat. He grabbed my hand and pulled me to the mouth of the alley. Show me your favorite place to get food. Taking the lead, I brought him through the people streaming down the road, ducking around groups of chattering men and women whenever guards walked by. Here, I pointed to a sign over the door proclaiming everyone is welcome at the Toadstool Tavern. Dellen took in the bar, dancing and singing up front, and the diverse groups of people gathered around tables, talking and eating with his mouth open. So this is what a tavern's like. Wait, it gets better, I said, ordering two meals from the barkeep. Moments later, we sat at a table with two dishes of honeyed duck in front of us. Oh my god, Stellan shoved his, the food into his mouth, rarely chewing before he swallowed. I've never tasted anything so delicious in my life. Don't you have the best chefs in the kingdom? Yeah, but it's all the same, you know, this, oh this. He took another huge bite. It's sweet, but not, and tastes different from what we have in the castle. I smiled. Maybe you need to ditch your guards more often. Dellen nodded, mouth too full to say anything. I watched him finish his food. The royals were far removed from normal society, viewed in the same light as the gods, but Dellen acted like every other kid I've known. Do you leave the castle often? The prince grimaced, uh, wiping his face on his sleeve. Not as much as I'd like. Oh, I glanced down at my plate, pushing the last bite around. I could feel his eyes on me. I'm talented as excu at excuses, though. A smile tucked at my lips. I have more places like this, if you still need a tour guide. I'd rather have a friend. His smile glanced as he glanced, as faded as he glanced to, at the door. Two tall knights in full armor walked in, hands resting on the hilts of their swords. Here, take this. If you ever need me, come to the castle. Dellen pulled a silver chain from around his neck. A medallion hung from it, the royal family crest on one side and his name carved in runes on the other. I closed my fingers around it. I'll find you again as soon as I can. They can't keep me hidden away forever. Dellen winked and slipped from the table, walking to the knights. They gave him disapproving looks before turning and walking from the tavern. Dellen turned and waved one last time. I waved back, but he was already out the door. Dropping the medallion over my head, I hid it under my shirt and raced back to the brothel. The lecture waiting for me did nothing to take away my elation of having made my first real friend. All right. Uh, the next story uh, is entitled... Where is this? Running with the wolf. Something lives under my skin or someone. I can feel it, them, whatever, yearning to escape. It's like an itch in my brain. I like to run. The thing inside likes to chase. The running helps. After school, I change out of my uniform and throw on shorts and an old concert tee. Shedding the restrictive tight skirt and button-up blouse in my Catholic school uniform and putting on the worn, comfortable clothes gives me a sense of relief already. But I wish I could keep going, peel my skin right off, and let them free. I ignore the impulse as best as I can and lace up my sneakers. Running is the only time that I feel free. The creature calls itself Haley. Pathetic, weep, simpering thing. When I awoke, I found myself imprisoned in this human body. Two arms, two legs, skinny and wobbly. A head without sharp teeth, bobbling on a stupidly designed weak neck. How do they keep themselves from flailing everywhere? If I had to stay in a body like that, I'd give up. But I won't, because I know I can get out. If it, she, just lets me. Only someone as close as me could tell that she's growing dissatisfied, wishing for something outside of the small village. When she starts running, I know she wants to keep going until she leaves this place and never looks back. When I run, I like to take the road out past the old factory. My dad used to work here until his lungs got too bad and he had to quit. Now it's just me and my mom, and there isn't work for either of us. No office jobs for her, and nothing but the occasional babysitting gig for me. And lately, I haven't liked being around kids. They're loud and annoying, and they make me think of how I'll probably be stuck here raising my some of my own in a few years. I duck under the chains, ineffectively blocking off the road leading to the factory. The blocky building lies abandoned up the path. The window's broken out. The paint on the sign peeling poppy yum dairy products. They used to make ice cream, cheese sticks, and other dairy delicacies. Now, I'll eat, now we all eat Ben and Jerry's. The sign is a grinning ice cream cone holding hands with a cheese stick that is ch crazy cheese hair. My stomach rumbles, but I don't want cheese. I'm craving a steak cooked really rare. The thing inside is grinning as madly as the logo at my breaking the rules, however small. Do you want to go inside? I wish I could speak out loud, command it, but right now the thought is enough. The girl already wants to enter. Haley walks up 
The front door of the abandoned factory jiggles the doorknob and opens it easily. A rush of excitement runs through both of us. I can feel it in her body, heart beating faster and her palms growing sweaty, both excited and nervous. I look out through her eyes. The factory is all dust and grime, dead machines and spider webs, and the nooks and crannies that once held the means of production. I see her gaze turn up towards the stairs leading to another room. I think a ruler of sorts used to sit there, monitoring the work. We all have our gods. I wondered if, da if my dad had ever sat here in the boss's office, talking with a foreman, or maybe being reprimanded for something. He had his near misses, almost getting fired a few times. Maybe it would have been better if he had, and then he wouldn't have been exposed to whatever turned his lungs. The door is unlocked. As I step inside, a pain blooms behind my eyes, sharp as a blade, throwing me off balance. I fall to my knees and my vision blurs. I see a flash of black fur, red eyes, and sharp yellow teeth. She screams. This whelp defies me. I'm used to being obeyed. Maybe she is not so weak after all, but I'm almost out. I can feel it. I have enough power to speak. On the tail end of her scream, I work my words into her voice. The desk. Open the drawer. We get up and move jerkily across the floor. Slide open the top drawer on the big drafting desk. Inside is a knife. The first relic. Blood. I want blood, and I can almost taste the hot iron on my tongue. I didn't expect anything to be in the drawer, did I? But something made me want to open it. Definitely didn't expect a silver knife, the handle decorated with rubies, but it seems right somehow. Right as I pick it up, open my palm, and draw the plate across, the sharp pain seems to drain my sudden headache, and I breathe a sigh of relief. Then I do what I've been craving all day. I put my palm to my lips and taste my blood. Freedom. With the ritual begun, my being pours out of its human vessel, and I land on all fours in the middle of the office, back in my own form. I stare across at the creature I spent so much time with, but am just now meeting in the flesh. I am Brigild, the wolf goddess, and I am hungry. I look across the small space of the black wolf with burning red eyes. I should be terrified, but I feel only a sense of familiarity and relief. The itch is gone. I'm Haley, I said, although it feels like a moot point. What now? My sisters, there are two more knives hidden in this town, and you're going to help me find them, because until they're free too, we're stuck together. Somehow, it doesn't sound so bad. It's time to shake up this little town. All right. The next story is a lesson in chemistry. Chemistry. Does anyone actually find meaning in this worthless class? Lincoln sauntered down the dark hallway of the ancient building to, to the dreaded classroom. After failing freshman year, he put off retaking the course until the last possible moment. But it was finally time that he complete the last of the, college, of the college's required general coursework. And this was the worst part of the course, the lab. It was no surprise that he was late. And it was no surprise that the only available seed was the station in the front row. But it was a surprise to see an attractive blonde at the station next to his. Perhaps it paid to be late. Perhaps fate was on his side. Lincoln's gaze lingered on the woman as she walked the aisle. Her delicate features called to him like a moth to a flame. He struggled to look away as he settled into his station. Lincoln Brandt, you're late, the TA barked from the front. Start experiment one. Yeah, yeah, lady. He flipped to the first page in his notebook. His eyes drifted to the station at his left. Lab might be a bright spot on this course after all. Lincoln leaned in to speak to the stunning creature beside him. A whiff of her fruity perfume had his pulse racing. He almost forgot what he bent over to ask. So, uh, so what do we do first? I am three steps from finishing. A heavy sigh passed through her tense lips. That wasn't an answer, but okay. He followed directions for the setup of the experiment, turning on the gas and starting the flame for the reaction. He may have not succeeded in obtaining a passing grade, but this wasn't his first rodeo. Another glance out of his periphery caused a chemical reaction, and not the kind that was supposed to be happening in chem lab. A rush of warmth flooded his body from head to toe. Were his palms sweating? We could work together, he tried again. Not a partner lab. She huffed a stray strand of, of hair from her face. Lincoln yearned to reach out and brush it away. Then what about some lively conversation? I'm quite personable. If we're going to be here all semester, then we should get to know one another. What's your major? Look, she tugged on the strand of her hair that had fallen back in her face and stuffed it back into a clip. I'm a bit occupied, as you should be. Lincoln sat back on a stool, neglecting the heating chemical reaction in front of him in exchange for watching the girl in the neighboring lab station do her work while doing her best to pretend he didn't exist. She concentrated on the work in front of her, flying through the steps in her lab notebook. 
She removed her finished reaction with the tongs. Her long, thin fingers with their neat sky blue polish gripped the tool. He imagined what those fingers would feel like gripping his arms or running down his chest. Lincoln shook his head to clear the daydream. Oh, he was in trouble. Maybe you could help me out a little before you go, Lincoln said as he angled his tall frame into her workspace, keeping his voice low. Excuse me? The girl asked, giving him a look like he had boils covering his face before returning back to her work. Lincoln smiled at her response. His own experiment started bubbling and clinking over the Bunsen burner in front of him, and he proceeded to add the next ingredient. But rather than watch the reaction, he continued to watch the enchanting girl beside him. She must be extraordinary intelligent to be able to handle the speed of the reactions in front of her without having to read and reread each step as was his norm. There was no doubt she was also very attractive, though her tight ponytail and fleece pullover suggested she cared little if anyone noticed. I see you have notes in the margins, he whispered, leaning it again. What of it? She asked. Her head snapped in his direction. Those gorgeous blue eyes narrowed at him, and the matching fingernail polish disappeared as her fist clenched at her side. Nothing of it, Lincoln said. Just noticed I don't have any notes. I'm not cheating, if that's what you're implying. Lincoln held up his hands in defense. Just observing your chemistry competency. Well, perhaps if you paid attention to your own experiment, you too might find some, may find some competency. She nodded at Lincoln's crucible, which was now rocking in place with the force of the reaction. Lincoln calmly removed it from the heat and scribbled a note in his lab notebook before returning his attention to his new distraction. He spoke to the back of her head since she was bent over jotting more results in her notebook. If you want to help me now, perhaps you would help me out later, maybe over some dinner, say Friday night? I don't think so, she said without looking Lincoln in the eye. She was now cleaning and clearing her workstation, already done with the tasks that would likely take Lincoln another hour. But I promise my conversational skills are better than my chemistry skills. Listen, she said, picking up her things and finally turning a polite, albeit forced smile, Lincoln's direction. I find you rather stereotypical and conceited. No offense, really. That would be fine for some women. You just aren't my type. With that, she exited the lab and left Lincoln sinking back on his own his stool, stunned. Even a glance into the failed experiment that sat charred at the bar bottom of his crucible didn't alter his mood. A smile creeped over his face as her words replayed in his head. Speaking her mind like that made her even more appealing. All right. The next story is entitled self defibrillation for the Criminally Insane. I opened my eyes and wondered why I was lying on the gym floor and staring into the face of a young man with amber eyes, blonde hair, and a halo illuminated by the lamp from the gym ceiling. Get off of me, you fool. You're crushing my ribs. I croaked to the man lying on me. If you're a student here, you are in big trouble, mister. I coughed. The haloed face smiled and purred so softly I could not hear. Speak up. I tried to push myself up from the gym floor. I seemed to be plastered on those old wooden plaques. Cletus. My name's Cletus. I'm here to save you. Don't move. Well, you can't anyhow. Lie still and wait for help to come. Cletus, or whoever he was, kept smiling at me. I tried to stand again. Now, I told you not to move, John. You're in pretty rough shape. Your ribs hurt? I grunted yes. Why can't you help me? I croaked out as I tried to ascertain what was wrong with me. Well, John, it's like this. Cletus looked around as if looking for someone. I swear his ears perked up. The gym was empty, but for us. You had a heart attack, John, and the boss was worried about you. Thought you could use a friend while you waited for someone to save you. You don't have many friends here, do you, John? I knew he was right. You a teacher or a student? Teacher or student? You a funny man, John. I don't go here. I'm here for the milk. Comedy was not a stock in trade. Run and get me help, Cletus frowned, only for a second as he appeared to lick his own nose. I have a particular job to do, and I am doing that job. My head fell back onto the wood floor and hurt. My left arm lay numb, useless. I tried my best to move my head to see. My right hand was wrapped around a red machine. It looked familiar. The defibrillator, said Cletus. I was so proud of you. You saved your own life with that. Impressive. Impressive. No, I moaned. No one can defibrillate my himself. You did it. Cletus stared at my chest. I stared as well. Barely. Two red marks decorated my skin. The silent gym became quieter. I knew what those marks were about. Did Cletus? You had a heart attack. He knew. All the family in your all the men in your family died from heart attacks. Your great grandfather smoked like a chimney. 
your grandfather worked in an asbestos factory. Your father was born with a hole in the heart, and you drink too many energy drinks to keep up with those harlots you hang out with. You have to stop it, man. It will kill you. Who says harlot in the 21st century? I asked. That's your takeaway from what I just told you? Cletus, Cletus stared at me. You have problems, friend, and I'm supposed to help you, but I'm not sure I will now. I slowly got some of my strength back, but I would need help to get off the floor and get out of this room. But Cletus made no room toward me. I tried to reach out and grab him. I knew he was close enough to touch, but I couldn't. Who are you? Why were you in my personal files? I'm in your head, John. I know it's in your heart, and it ain't blood. Cletus stared into my blank face. I felt a color drain from my chest to my chest. Don't leave me yet, John. We have business. I was going down. I wanted to go to sleep. I wanted Cletus to shut up. Angel, I'm your guardian angel. Shut up, you idiot. Let me die. I wrapped my good hand around the defibrillator so hard it hurt. Give me a reason to live. If you are my guardian angel, you must know something I don't know. Impress me. Your job? I hate my job. I became a teacher for all the time off. No one else would do that for me. Cletus shook his head at me. You would be in prison if you had not accepted this job. Psychiatry. You're chasing death mites, my friend. My faith in my guardian angel was waiting. The judge agreed I should not go to prison. You tasted the catnip, and now you can't let go. Are we done here? Just giving up, are we? Cletus finally asked. The energy drinks are finally taking over that bad ticker of yours. Cletus purred for a moment and watched my hand, possibly hoping I would move the defibrillator closer. I was not going to give him satisfaction. Cheryl? The girl in the office, I asked, although I knew who she was. Cletus perked up. I moved the defibrillator closer. I liked Cheryl. She was nice to me. Spoke to me even if a few in the office ever had. Even the principal ignored me most times. No, Cletus, you lose. The defibrillator lay on my chest, but I didn't turn it on. My last thoughts would be of Cletus staring at me with cat-like intensity that haunted me as much as my past life, which was boring me to death. I had nothing to live for. Then Cletus began licking me on the cheek. His tongue was rough like sandpaper. He must have sat on my chest again for it for it began to burn. I heard other voices. My eyes opened and I found a Persian licking my face. His face was encircled by the light above his head, hanging from the ceiling. Cletus, there you are, bad boy. A woman's voice came from behind the Persian, Cheryl from the office. Cheryl picked up Cletus and began to stroke my cheek simultaneously. Poor dear, help is on the way. Maybe I had something to live for, after all. All right. Now the next story is hold on here. Two's company. Carrie steered her hot pink powered wheelchair into the restaurant. She hadn't had a date for a while and she was ready to be back after some disaster date she'd rather not remember. Her little black dress was short and tight and diamond earrings her mother had given her for her birthday reached her shoulders. Her hand trembled on her wheelchair control as she waited to be shown to a table. Her hand started to sweat. She wished the line wasn't so long. She breathed deep like she'd learned in physiotherapy. She still felt on edge. The waitress was busy trying to see a family of nine in front of her. All the kids turned and stared at her. She smiled and said, hi. They whispered and pushed, sneaking backward glances at her as they finally reached their table. She wanted kids, or she had, but now she wasn't so sure. The waitress showed her to a secluded round table in the corner, showed her a cosmopolitan and stared at the vase of white flowers in the middle of the table. She listened to the music, a song she loved. She barely heard the words, though, because of her nerves. What's wrong with me, she wondered. It wasn't the first time she'd been on a date. It was hard to find a guy before she finished high school at the all-girls school her parents made a fortune for. Carrie? A deep voice startled her out of her thoughts. She looked up into the eyes of, col of the color of dark chocolate. Olive skin, black hair, toned, muscled, all wrapped up in a package of dark wash jeans and a white shirt. Her woody perfume floated on the air as he stretched out his hand. Carrie tried to stretch her arm out, but it started to spasm. He waited until it stopped and then took her hand and shook it. His touch was so gentle that it sent shivers up her spine. Sorry to startle you. I'm Greg. Hi, Greg. He took a seat across from her and signaled to the waitress for a beer. Tell me about yourself, he said as they waited for steaks and fries. Um, why don't you go first? Okay, I'm Greg and I'm from Beverly Hills. I'm a physical therapist. Carrie listened with interest. He'd have to keep his body in good shape to help others. His gaze, her gaze went over his lips, his toned arms. So now you. Oh, well, I'm Carrie and write for a fashion magazine. I have a cat called Sunny and that's it. That's it. 
How mysterious. She sipped her drink to keep from blushing. He was so handsome. The drink relaxed her. Suddenly, she felt her legs cramping and let out a groan. Greg was by her side, massaging her legs in a restaurant. She barely registered how embarrassing that really was. The spasms were intense. Cerebral palsy, right? He looked at her with a tender grin. She nodded and concentrated as his strong hands and firm grip worked their magic. After minutes, she felt better. He looked at her, leaned in, and she kissed him. Dessert? He asked. They went back to the table for round two, a chocolate brownie sundae. They had two spoons and talked more between mouthfuls. Carrie was happy. Chocolate and a hot guy. What else did a girl need? He took a spoon and fed her. He was gentle, all right. He planted a kiss on her forehead and ran down more her nose. She giggled. She barely knew him, but she felt so safe. Wanted again and hoped he felt the same. She looked at him, trying to read something in his eyes. She felt she was a good judge of character and like she was trying to move on in the right direction, she hoped. They ate alternate bites of brownie, cookie, hot fudge sauce, and whipped cream from the tall dessert glass. She heard coffee and talked long into the night. She heard how he had three brothers and a sister. Her, his sister had CP too. She's the reason I'm a physical therapist, she said. Seeing everything she went through made me want to help people with disabilities. Carrie talked about how she was an only child, how her birth mom had shocked her mom into not, into not wanting more kids, how her mom was like a best friend to her. He was so understanding and not judgmental. She felt she could talk all night. She talked and talked. Her, the waitress neared the table. Sorry, closing time. She picked up the coffee cups. Carrie's heart sank as she looked at Greg. Will I see you again? I don't want to go. She felt like a petulant child and bet she sounded like one too. She didn't want to go back home, not just yet, to a world of careers and schedules and trying to fight to be respected and included. She felt safe here. She felt wanted and she thought she'd never feel that way again. Greg asked, okay, if I give you my number? Okay, she thought. Of course it was okay. She felt like she had brain fog coming on and concentrated hard as she gave him the number. Fatigue was setting in, but she wanted to stay with him all night. Her phone pinged with a message, his number. Then he was helping her on with her jacket, his strong arms around her. She ached to kiss him. He guided her wheelchair as she was too tired now. He called for a cab for her. The last thing he did as he helped guide her was a kiss her was to kiss her long and deep and say, I love the date. I want to see you again. She smiled to herself all the way home, thinking of tonight and the time she'd see Greg again. Whatever, whenever it was, she hoped it would be soon. All right. Uh, this next one is entitled untitled i'm not sure nope that's not it next time i'm going to do this differently i promise <laughs> uh, what is it it's called Here. i have this excel spreadsheet with my winners and it's not giving me what i want i'm sorry here I have no idea why I can't find this. Uh... Ah, first impressions, I believe. Yep. Sorry about that. I arrived five minutes early at the Sapphire Lounge. It's agreeable in the way that every upscale watering hole in San Francisco is. The cavernous space is bathed in glowing blue light and exotic hardwood taken from some rainforest. Probably the same endangered jungle that every person here has donated money to protect. Our ancestors used to hunt in the wild. My hunting ground is here. Then I see her. She's scanning the other patrons like a lioness on the savannah, seeking prey and assessing threats, but also like she owns the place. A man at the bar says something to her as she walks past. She doesn't even acknowledge his presence. First impressions are the hardest. You have a single moment until you get a label. I fight the urge to get up, to be seen, and give a friendly wave in my hand to call her attention. But some part of me wants to watch, see what she does. The photos I posted on my profile were from when I was in the military, not even a year ago, but I was sporting a beard back then. I'm curious to see if she could pick me out in this crowd. Finally, her eyes find me, but I check my phone instead. Pretend I don't notice, but I catch everything. In the corner of my eye, I see her approach. Matt, she says, but is already sitting down. She knows. I put my phone down, feigning surprise. 
She's already sitting, but I push my chair back as I stand. Lily? I was starting to wonder if we'd ever meet, I say, extending my right hand. Lily stands back up, blushing. Her hand disappears in my palm. Firm grip, despite her diminutive size. I hold it for a few heartbeats, then pull it toward me and give her knuckles a kiss, like Dracula would do. The pink of her cheeks brightens, reminding me of a cherry that's ready to be was ready to pluck from a tree. Please have a seat. I ordered you a beverage. Hope you don't mind. A man after my heart, she said, followed by a sly grin. Whiskey? Bullet. On the rocks, of course. Lily reaches out and squeezes my hand. God bless you. I pat the back of her hand, the same I kissed a moment ago. I can still smell her hand lotion. There's a subtle hint of rosemary. One of those days, huh? Ugh, she groans the worst. We hired a new project manager last month. She must have lied her ass off on her resume. She rolls her eyes. Plus, I don't remember seeing the word babysitter anywhere in my job description. She takes her hand back. Her manicured nails trace the retreat across the back of my hand. But work shit is boring. Usually, but not always. Venting helps. And booze, too. I gotta admit, though, we've been chatting for two weeks, and I feel already feel like I've known you forever. I know, right? Same here. We chat for a few minutes until the waitress interrupts by delivering our drinks. Two whiskeys over ice. I'm more of a tequila guy, but it's always best to have what your date is drinking. It builds a sense of camaraderie. All right, she says after taking a long drink as to stiffen and resolve. Small talk is for small minds. Time for a real question. I follow her example, emptying my half of my glass and lean forward to rest my chin on my folded hands. Interesting. Ask away. Okay, no judgment, right? I nod. This table is a judgment-free zone. Lily takes a deep breath and releases it with a shudder. If you were a serial killer, what would you collect as a trophy? The question hits me like a scalpel to my spleen. I think my left eye might have twitched. I'm, ne I'm never so careless, but I've never been asked such a direct question that hits so close. I laugh, hoping it's effective camouflage. There are no more serial killers. She purses her lips and cocks an eyebrow. Adorable. You're deflecting. You've caught me off guard. Okay, hold on. Let me think. My mind race is trying to think of an appropriate answer, something quirky and unexpected, something that isn't nailed down toward any particular gender, ethnic group, or whatever else, something ubiquitous. Fingernails, I reply. Final answer. Her face scrunches up. Gross, dude. I clench my heart, feigning wounded pride. Everyone has fingernails. It's a solid choice. Well, that's a bit ableist, she says. What about double amputees? They have a hard enough time. One would have to be a true savage to target people with disabilities. The word you're searching for is ableist. No, I'm just not an asshole, I reply before I catch my sip. Well, if I was a killer, I guess I would only target people who had it coming. I finished my drink. My mind was already going into damage control. Okay, what about you? What trophies are you taking? Lily leans forward on her elbows, eyes searching mine. That's easy. I'd collect an eyeball from my victims. I return her stare. Why the eyes? I ask almost a whisper. Because the eyes are the windows to the soul, I say, finishing the sentence. On her face is a knowing smile. I return it and wave it to the waitress to let her know we're ready to order. We both choose the steak, rare, with asparagus. There's a silence between us, but it's far from awkward. I'm not sure what this is, but I want to find out. So we're both collectors. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. She takes my hand again, gentle squeeze. I would rather have you see my collection than be added to it. I reach across the table, once again taking her head. I couldn't agree more. All right. And the uh, final one. Oh, wait. No, that is the final one. <laughs> yes, that is the final one. I was like, that was my problem. All right. So those are your uh, choices. Uh, lots of variety there in the genre, right? Uh, you got a little bit of you got a fair amount that are kind of romance you have ones that are uh even on the horror side the fantasy side i did try uh to vary the uh choices uh like i said it was a very challenging thing to pick so if you did not make it to the end please don't take it too personally it was quite uh challenging and i'm going to go ahead and uh, give you that uh poll just a second here uh, where is my link here? And I'm going to throw it in the chat. I'm going to go back and look at some of my, um, from the comments here. I wasn't reading. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That was very, I do enjoy this. Uh, 
I'm not like I've done a little bit of acting uh, in a community theater, but not not certainly nothing major. But it is fun, um, for sure. All right. Um, you'll notice too in the survey, there's a little bit of a synopsis, so it should help you uh, figure out which one is which. Because I understand it's hard to uh, keep the titles straight. I was trying to see if anybody here was in. Ah, look at that. That's yours. See? And you were so worried that you were not going to get selected. And look at that. You made it. You made it. Uh, if any of you didn't make it to the finalists, go ahead and give yourself a shout out so I can go ahead and uh, shout you out with you. I'm just catching up with the comments as the survey results come in. <laughs> the last one creeped you out a bit. I think that was the intention of the writer. I would think so. Um, it was, um, um, you don't take it personally way too dark for Daniel. Honestly, Tammy, it was really close. It was really close. I was a little bit, concern from a YouTube standpoint, to be honest, um, of of hitting something, but it was close. Um, I, I did think it was very effective. So <laughs> sorry for creeping everybody out. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's that's necessary, necessary. All right. So uh, while we're waiting for the survey results to come in, Fantasy Club, Fantasy Club is tonight. So uh, 7 p.m., I'm going to be doing live reviews. So if you have material that you would like to get uh, reviewed by somebody, uh, I will be doing it live. You don't have to sign up in advance. You can just show up. This is for AutoCrit Pro members. So keep that in mind. Horror is tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, in the Horror Club this week, we are going to discuss creatures. Gareth will be on hand to discuss how in the how to design interesting creatures and make them compelling. I'd also like to announce that we have a romance course starting soon. Now, you may have noticed we had quite a few romance uh, in this uh, challenge, which is awesome. Um, I'm a big fan of romance myself. And we actually will be bringing on a new teacher for the romance course. And we're very excited about that. And I believe we'll have her on uh, the live stream soon. So uh, you'll get to meet her there as well. We might even do a member event. Uh, you're going to get more introductions to it. However, um, if you want to check out more information about it, I'm going to go ahead and throw it in the chat. And I'm going to throw up a uh, little banner here if I can have it. And you can check out more information about this course. Penning Passion. We like our alliteration around here at Autocrit. <laughs> but I've been going over the material because I'm part of the development team for the class. And yeah, it's very thorough. There's a lot of interesting pieces of advice. It's hard to find pieces of advice that I haven't seen before. And uh, it did have that. So it was uh, really cool. Really cool. I'm looking forward to seeing it in its full form. Uh, beginning March 20th. They'll have live lectures as well as uh, recorded content. And of course, everything will be available on demand after it's over. Okay. Um, accountability Club. You might have been joining me on the Accountability Club. Our accountability group is wonderful. We all get together and uh, we uh, encourage each other to be accountable to us by telling us what it is they're going to work that week. Because as soon as you do that, you're basically saying, this is what I'm signing up to do. And then we check up on you the next week. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. And we do little exercises and we do a writing sprint uh, in uh, like an in-person writing as it were, a virtual in-person writing. And we all work together and it's uh, quite helpful. Somebody said we you lost me. I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope I didn't lose anybody else. All right. So I'm just waiting on the results from uh, the uh, from the survey. So just give it one more minute just to make sure everybody gets a chance to put in their votes. 
have a pretty good response. Yeah, I think I'm pretty comfortable with the way it's at. So I'm going to call it. Uh, let's see. Who is the winner? Oh, it's close. I thought it was going to be close. And the winner of the Character Connection Challenge is... First Impressions. Yes, the serial killers. <laughs> Apparently, creeping people out paid off. Um, I believe the person who wrote that is here. Um, so go ahead and uh, reveal yourself, First Impressions author. Um, and you have one. Uh, as a prize, you have an opportunity to uh, win. Uh, you have your selection. So you can either get a free uh, trip to the, uh, the Penning Passion course. You can do the horror course. Uh, you can do the self-editing workshop. Or if you're not an Autocrypt member, uh, you can become an annual member for a year. So uh, you can choose any of those prizes and uh, you will be uh, the grand winner. I believe he announced himself earlier. Yes, Douglas Sherman. There you are. Whoop, whoop. Good for you. Autocrit members love murder. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, yay. So fun. <laughs> Um, just to recap some of the other results, uh, second place was uh, still not quite human, the AI story. And then it was very close between everybody else. Everybody at least got one vote. So it got it got quite, quite split after that point. Those were the two standouts. Um, but yeah, I was I was wondering which those were honestly the ones that I expected would place the top. That's why I put them at the ends. Um, and so uh congratulations to both of you so runner up still not quite human all right so march what's coming to march on the youtube channel we're going to take a look under the hood in autocrit and we're going to examine some of the wonderful things that autocrit can do to help you self-edit and also talk about self-editing a bit and polishing up your manuscript so it's going to be a little bit of a diy month we're going to talk about that. And of course, we're going to have um, a special presentation for the romance course. So it's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge. Uh, in terms of a challenge, we are not going to do a YouTube challenge next month. However, uh, we've been having a lot of fun with these pop-up challenges we're doing in the community. So we decided next month we're going to do a lot more of those. So if you like doing challenges, don't worry, there'll be more of those. And we'll make them a little bit longer. Recently, we've been kind of doing them a short bit of time. We'll do them like over a couple of days on these short little blitz challenges because it's just a great way to keep yourself motivated, right? And uh, it also allows us to potentially come up with some interesting parameters. So if you are an Autocrypt Pro member, uh, check out in uh, the community for more information about March. It'll be a little bit of, I guess, our own little March madness. <laughs> uh, that would be kind of fun, actually, to play it like that. I just thought of that. That'd be fun. Uh, can we do longer challenges in the community or on YouTube? Uh, we will be doing more challenges on YouTube. Don't worry. This is not the end of challenges on YouTube. We're just taking a little bit of a hiatus for March. And like I said, doing little uh, ones in the community. All right. Well, I will see you around the Autocrit community. Thank you so much for joining me. Congratulations to our winners. And uh, yeah, we will see you around. Bye, everybody.